In the mid-50s, toy trains weren't something you got into because you wanted to change the world. It was a sleepy hobby for painting cars and carefully positioning trees. Until someone came along and saw model trains for what they really are, a network. A group of bored computer science students started a tech model railroad club and changed everything. The gang broke into the college's mainframe. They soldered in phone lines to control trains independently. Where most saw a dorky hobby, they saw the potential to derail a whole system. They even wrote a dictionary to define what they were doing, applying ingenuity to create clever results, or as they called it, hacking. And just like that, the world's first computer hackers were born. The years passed, and hackers found their home on the personal computer. There, they rediscovered the thing that they knew best, networks. Nothing had changed. They were still testing what their toys could do. Only now, networks had become central to our lives. Banking, transport, agriculture, governments. Suddenly, hackers had the power to derail much more than toy trains. Some used that power for their own gains. Heavily funded nation states waged war, criminal gangs stole millions, and then they came for people. The data of billions of users who rely on the internet to live their daily lives. And who could stop them? The only ones who understood the internet like the attackers, the hackers. Those who were breaking the system in order to make it safer. The ones who saw the system for what it was, a network worth protecting. When it's your job to keep billions of people safe online, you have to live and breathe and see the internet just like the attackers do. Because the only way to stop a hacker is to think like one. This is not weird at all. <laughs> <laughs> Just another day at the office. My name is Heather Atkins. I'm a VP of Security Engineering at Google. When I have to tell people what I do for work, it's really difficult. It's really complicated, so I usually just tell them that I keep the hackers out of Google. And I think most people understand what that means. Heather has filled just about every security role imaginable at Google, leading teams on the front lines of every major cyber attack against the company and its users. If you've heard of it, she's defended against it. And if you haven't heard of it, you can thank her for that too. So when you want to know about the most devastating attack in Google's history, there's probably no one better to ask than her. Let's see what the right intro for that is. Um, what better intro than the song of the summer? Welcome to 2009. 2009 was an exciting time at Google. 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 Android, Android Street View. Nine Nine directional is cameras. preparing to launch its own operating, operating system. system. Very simple, very intuitive. It just works. Building new and interesting products and building security into those products and the infrastructure. We thought we were doing a pretty good job. So it was a, a shocking moment to have everything sort of stop. December 14th. It was around 4 p.m. Just come out of my last meeting of the day, returned to my desk, and found a, a hive of energy nearby. Everyone standing around a computer sort of talking, and 
they told me that they found some very interesting activity. That interesting activity was the result of one message sent to a Google employee. A casual question with a seemingly innocent link. On any given day, there are over 5 billion links clicked across the internet. But this particular link changed the course of cybersecurity history. It opened a website hosted across the world and started invisibly downloading malicious software onto the Google employee's computer. And just like that, they were in. The attackers used that single entry point to establish a foothold on Google's network. I was contacted by an incident responder, and they said, hey, um, you know, we think we have something on one of your Windows machines. So the pull for me into security was one uh, that was kind of cataclysmic, I, I would say, right? But it really struck me as something that, that I wanted to be part of. At the time, security was nowhere near Tim Wynn's job title. He was responsible for maintaining all the Windows systems running at Google which explains why he got a call about one of his machines acting strangely. Um, honestly, I was pretty naive. I mean, I thought, you know, okay, one machine was compromised. That sucks, right? My day sucks. But literally by the hour, it got worse. It was a server that was meant for testing. It was tucked away in a corner of a data center. And the attacker had really set up home on that network. We could see right away, I mean, there should not be a breach of this size. That just should be happening. This is Eric Gross. He was the head of Google's privacy and security team when all of this went down. We did not have playbooks for how to deal with all this. This wasn't an ordinary security event. The speed, the ability for the attacker to learn on the fly, change their tactics, it was extraordinary. It was different, it was unique. I mean, my world had just changed, right? We dropped everything and focused on this. The following day, I was pinged again. Tim, can you come to the war room? There's a few of us here looking at additional machines. I was like, okay. By the third day, I just went straight to the war room. I didn't even go back to my desk. And that's where I sat for, I think, the next six weeks straight. The investigation started with one dedicated conference room. And that quickly grew into three conference rooms and four conference rooms, and then suddenly a whole building. They came by plane, train, automobile, and any means necessary. Traveling in person or dialing in daily. Specialized engineers like Mike Sinnoh flew in from New York. I was up at 2.30 that morning to catch the 6 o'clock flight. And the head of incident response called off his vacation. I was on holiday uh, in New Zealand, so I did some of the work remotely. I was attempting to do forensics, you know, over dial-up. But pretty soon it became a book the first flight, turn up in Mountain View and, and, and make it happen. I remember landing in San Francisco airport, and from that point we were barreling down the highway at like 100 miles an hour, and it didn't slow down for weeks afterwards. A patchwork team assembled from around the globe. Heather raised the beacon, Googlers answered, and she immediately put them to work. It definitely felt like something out of a spy movie. Heather handed me a list of machines and said, go get them. Go pull hard drives out of machines all over campus. And this is in the middle of the night. So we hop in the rental car and we're driving around campus in the dark. We've got a bunch of flashlights running through buildings, capturing machines to do forensics on it. First, we started trying to unscrew and pull the hard drives out, but we decided that was taking too long. So we were just taking the machine. Just unplugging their systems and leaving a post-it note for them. because <laughs> security was here. Please call this number. We had a stack of hard drives and a stack of machines in the trunk of the car. By that stage, we had a number of people just kind of churning through, looking at the different systems and figuring out like what happened on this machine. While the team was running forensics around the clock, Heather raised the alarm for others in the industry. And I got this call from Heather Atkins, who wanted to chat with me about something that they had discovered at Google. Enter Dmitry Alperovich. He's the chairman of Silverado Policy Accelerator, a global cybersecurity think tank. But back in 2009, he was honing his craft at a security firm called McAfee, 
what began as professional courtesy turned into partnership as Dimitri and his team were willing to roll up their sleeves. Google shared malware code with us, zeros and ones effectively. So we immediately put a team on trying to dissect that exploit, understand how it works. And most of it is mumbo jumbo to an average person if they're not uh, proficient in programming. But occasionally you see these code words that would be recognizable to anyone. The word Aurora jumped out immediately in those first minutes of looking at the malware. Aurora. Why would that jump off the page? Well. October 1917. A shot rings out from a Russian ship patrolling the Baltic. The shell was empty. The message wasn't. A shot that would start the Russian Revolution and forever change the course of the 20th century. And the name of the battleship that fired the fateful shot? You guessed it, Aurora. When I saw it, I instantaneously knew that I had to name the whole operation Aurora. Because just as the battleship Aurora fired a single shot that sent shockwaves resonating decades afterward. Operation Aurora in cyberspace, I think had a similar effect. The world has changed. We have to change everything about the industry's approach to cybersecurity to deal with a new threat. When you get attacked, it's a bit like playing a game of chess. If your opponent opposite you knows every move you're going to make, it's going to be very easy for them to build counter moves to checkmate. We wanted to keep that element of surprise for as long as possible by studying as much as we can about the attack and then cutting them off instantaneously. The team went to great lengths to keep the investigation absolutely secret. We pretty much had to lock down the entire floor. There was a secret list of who could come in or out. We would put security guards outside the door, a little bit speakeasy style. You had to kind of know how to get in. Even cleaning staff weren't allowed in the main war room. Pizza boxes and empty coffee cups kind of sprayed throughout the room. It was, it was smelly for quite some time. They stopped corresponding with each other online. Just in case we were being watched. The access controls to the room were tight. We had senior VPs, we had the founders of the company with us. It was, you know, it was tense. As you're building this picture of how the attacker is working, it's a rush of adrenaline because you can start to plot points of how to eradicate them from the network. The team narrowed in, set traps, and positioned themselves to move on the attacker. There was only one problem. Holiday break. We always wonder if the attackers pick the holidays on purpose. They know most people aren't paying attention during the holidays. It wasn't our first Christmas where, you know, something interesting had come up. Just before springing on the attacker, the team pivoted. We suddenly decided we wanted to be very radical in our approach. So what was that radical approach? We knew we had to get everyone off the network now. We had to make the biggest change we ever made to our infrastructure, and we had to do it in less than an hour. And who would be responsible for pulling the trigger? <laughs> you know, I, I, I do the short straw, so part of my role was really to cut off everybody from the network. That's right, everybody. Google engineers, security researchers, even Heather, yeah. were to be cut off from the network and their passwords reset. I did not make any friends at the company over Christmas. This was the only option, to make absolutely sure that any hooks the attacker had at Google were completely eradicated. And with that, the team hit go. Systematically purging the attacker from all systems all at once. The attacker was banished from the network. But one question still remained. Who was behind this attack? On January 12th of 2010, Google announced it had witnessed a sophisticated and targeted attack. It was shocking. Google was one of the first companies ever that voluntarily disclosed that they've been hacked. And in the investigation of that event, we found that at least 20 other companies were compromised as well. 
we were able to lend some experience that we'd gathered. Not only did they come out and publicly reveal that they'd been hacked, but for the first time, they were able to attribute their attack. In mid-December, we detected a highly sophisticated and targeted attack on our corporate infrastructure. Originating from China, we discovered in our investigation that the accounts of dozens of Gmail users around the world who advocate for human rights in China appear to have been accessed by third parties. Uh, the president is obviously aware of it. As with all intrusions, we employ a, an all-of-government approach with the appropriate agency in the lead. In this case, the FBI is coordinating the response. Now the cyber battle has heated up and may have far-reaching consequences. I didn't used to think that a foreign military would come after us, and now they obviously are. Well, where are the new boundaries? What's internationally accepted legitimate action? It's not a surprise that we would see governments hacking each other. I think it's a little bit of a surprise to us when we saw attacks happening against private companies, against companies that were enabling business online, helping students learn, helping people express themselves. That seemed out of bounds. We view it as our job to stand between these very capable government attackers and individuals who can't possibly be expected to defend against that. We chose to stand in between. We stopped them, but I'm not convinced that they would never try again. So we decided we wanted to start making radical changes, not just rebuilding things the way that we had them before, but we wanted to do things completely different, ways people have never dreamed of before, ways attackers had never dreamed of before, we were gonna change the battlefield. I'm realistic that there will be threat actors who want to do the same thing. But if they do try again, I want them to have a very bad day. The primary job of threat analysis is to understand the attacker so we can counter them and we can protect our users from them. Um, we're dark wizard catchers. Government back threats. Ransomware. Phishing messages. It's essentially a field of landmines. Hostile actors are trying to interfere with election. It's not enough to draw a fence around the people that you see on the front page of the newspaper. You have to secure everyone. There are bad actors online who would not like to see democracy succeed. 